I'm going to start us off with a quick kind of description of what happened in, uh, in January and February of 1919. So the context is Seattle is a boom town, much like today in some ways. In both cases, a high-tech industry moved into town, completely rearranged things, attracts tens of thousands of new workers, most of whom are white and male, uh, and uh, young male. And, um, and people scramble for housing, and rents go up, and it's a pretty crazy making time. The difference is that that was war, and this is Amazon, so a different kind of war, I guess. In any case, you can see the high-tech industry, shipyards uh, with federal contracts to build transport ships for the war, um, 37 different shipyards up and down uh, Elliott Bay and around uh, Puget Sound. So there is a picture of that. Seattle was, even before, a labor city. Women led unions. One of the most important was the Waitresses Union, started early in the century by Alice Lord. And you can see they're celebrating 500 members. Virtually all of the cafes and restaurants were unionized, closed shop, uh, either the Waiters Union or Waitresses Union. Um, very powerful, and this was a, a, a principal base for the industrial workers of the world. Uh, the Industrial Worker, the main English language newspaper, was published in Seattle from 1913 to until it was put out of business during the war. This is a picture that shows probably uh, uh, an IWW uh, headquarters hall uh, before the war. During, after 1918, with the IWW under federal um, suspicion and most of the uh, uh, leaders arrested. It was very hard to open and manage uh, an open facility like a IWW Hall. Uh, police would raid and shut it down as soon as one appeared. Uh, the context was also complicated. Wars take lives and create confusion of all kinds. And this one, in the, in the last months of the war, uh, became very deadly for people in Seattle and Washington State. The Spanish flu epidemic had worked its way around the globe, killing millions and millions uh, as in, the, in 1918. And it comes to Seattle and Washington State quite late. So September, October, and November, and December of 1918, just before the strike, is a time for um, emergency medical uh, concerns, about 1,400 residents of the city and county uh, lost their lives to the flu. So that's kind of the background. The other part of the background, and Cal's going to tell us much more about this, was uh, the, the uh, grievances of shipyard workers. So there are about 35,000 almost entirely men uh, working in the uh, shipbuilding industry. And, um, and they're getting underpaid. And they've been underpaid through the war because the federal government is running the shipyards and, and setting wage rates, setting pretty much uniform wage rates across the country. Costs are higher in the West Coast, but there's not much allowance made for that. There's a near strike or a short strike in 1917, which is sort of settled when, um, or settled down, when the feds appear to promise to raise wages and allow collective bargaining at the end of the war, and then they break that promise. And so in, in uh, in December of 18 and January of, of 1919, the Metal Trades Council, the, the industrial form of the different shipyard unions, uh, concludes that the only recourse is to strike. And on January 22, a strike begins. Here's Skinner and Eddy shipyards, the largest of them. It's kind of across the way, across Alaska Highway from the um, football stadium today and the bus tour, we just went, went by that space. Um, so the shipyard workers are out on strike, and very quickly they appeal to the Central Labor Council. Then, as now, Central Labor Council tried to coordinate the activities of all the different unions. There are about 110 local affiliates at that point, representing about 60,000 workers in Seattle, about a third of the labor force are members of unions. That was the labor temple, uh, the Labor Temple was on uh, 6th uh, near, at the corner of University, uh, now sort of a convention center type area. But you can see it was a, an impressive building. 
especially for those times. And that becomes the center of activity uh, both before and during the strike. Uh, Jimmy Duncan, he was the uh, secretary of the Central Labor Council, was then Seattle Central Labor Council. And here is an earlier meeting of some of the uh, leaders, and you can see that women, white women, not women of color, but white women uh, have a place and a role in the labor movement in Seattle that was pretty distinctive, much um, kind of better represented than in most cities. So uh, the drama of uh, the two weeks after the shipyard workers go on strike is all about whether uh, individual unions will agree to honor the request for a sympathy strike. What we call the general strike was a sympathy strike, it was a solidarity strike. Its only real goal was to help the shipyard workers it win uh, the, 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 the negotiations with the federal government. So it was, what was being asked of the unions was a really quite extraordinary thing. You know, go out, risk your job. The Longshore Union not only risked their contract, they lost their contract, and in the aftermath, uh, lost not only a closed shop, but the whole union eventually um, uh, was, was destroyed for a time. Anyway, so the risk was very meaningful, but one after another, the unions took votes of their members, and 101 of them agreed to go out on strike. So that was an amazing kind of gesture of solidarity, uh, not for the benefit of the individual, individuals involved or the unions, but instead to back up uh, the shipyard workers. And here the Seattle Union record, which is published by the Central Labor Council, this is the only Central Labor Council in the country to publish a daily newspaper. The Seattle Union record had a circulation of about 60,000 and uh, competed head-to-head -head with the Seattle Times, PI, and Seattle Star. And here the Union record declares we're all going out, 60,000 workers, to respond to the call. And that's February 2. There are four days ahead of the uh, declared start of the strike, which will be February 6. And the next couple of days are very tense and exciting. Uh, strikers and unions and the Central Labor Council prepares how they're going to try and run, which things are going to stay open and which will close, how the unions will try to provide essential services through the city, keep the hospitals supplied, keep milk and groceries coming to those who need them. Um, and so here you can see uh, strikers going to one of the co-op stores and stocking up on supplies. This is a photo of Anna Louise Strong, and Cal's gonna talk a little more about her. On February 4th, this union record features on its front page an editorial written by Anna Louise Strong that becomes one of the signposts of this whole event. It's a very powerful statement. Part of it reads, as you can see, we are undertaking the most tremendous move ever made by labor in this country, a move which will lead, and then it's all caps, no one knows where. We do not need hysteria. We need the iron march of labor. So this is very provocative. Uh, union people uh, think this is uh, very exciting. And those who are not very friendly to labor and employers and the others who are nervous anyway now think, uh-oh, this is a call to revolution. This is something that will lead uh, in a dangerous direction. So it helps to ramp up the anxiety, which has been building anyway. Uh, employers, obviously, are not at all happy. City leaders are not happy. The Seattle Star here on the 4th comes out with an electrifying editorial of its own front page. What was important here is the Seattle Star had been sort of often labor friendly, it's not officially labor friendly, but uh, most progressive of the three uh, dailies other than the union record. And here, instead, it's saying this is dangerous and it's interpreting the call to the general strike as if it was a call for disorder and potential revolution. Mayor Ole Hansen, somewhat similarly, hadn't been a conservative. He had been a member of the Progressive Party earlier, had some labor-friendly credentials, but he gets wigged out uh, at the thought of this general strike. He authorizes um, 
several thousand men, volunteers, to come and serve as vigilantes in the case of violence. And the police in this picture are handing out weapons, many of those uh, uh, who will serve in Ole Hansen's vigilante force are returning veterans. So the anxiety is building um, in the two days before the strike. The uh, working class is one thing and the labor movement was something else. In 1919, there's only one union of any size in Seattle that admitted African Americans, and that's the Longshore Union, ILA, um, which had about 300 black uh, workers and uh, members and about 4,000, uh, membership of 4,000. The picture here is of Earl George, who had, was a returning veteran. He had gotten a job on the docks uh, just before the strike and, uh, and was part of the striking workforce, one of the few African Americans to participate. He later, he's a lifelong member of the ILWU, later leads uh, the first black um, president of an ILWU local, and he's pictured here obviously much later in life. And the other picture is the Bush Hotel and the Japanese American proprietors and workers. This is from the 1920s, so it's a few years later. But the employees of the Bush Hotel, Japanese workers, organized in three craft unions plus the Japanese Labor Association, which is a more general organization for labor, labor, uh, laborers, um, they all endorsed the strike. And the Central Labor Council said, hey, that's great. Thank you. Oh, yes, come and send a delegate to the uh, strike committee meeting. And guess what? You can't vote. Um, so, you know, it was, this was Jim Crow unionism, and as much as we want to think about the, um, what was accomplished and the exercise of solidarity, we have to understand that not everybody was included, and race was the principal exclusion, and then women workers were also quite second class. So, day one, the wheels stopped, said the, the uh, Seattle Union record, and the uh, labor movement, it's the strike council had set in place these essential services, no more, nothing more important than feeding people. Many single people lived in residency hotels and flop houses and other facilities. They didn't have uh, kitchens, so they needed to eat in cafes or restaurants, all of which are closed because the culinary unions are out on strike. So instead, the culinary unions undertake to feed thousands and thousands of people at dining stations. But uh, you can see members of the waitresses union and waiters union serving people um, at, at one of them. It's an entirely peaceful strike. One of the most remarkable parts of it is that it's entirely peaceful. All the preparations the mayor and the others have made is like, you know, the records show that there, unless Cal was found differently, um, not a single arrest in the course of the six days uh, linked to the strike. It's an entirely peaceful strike, in part because the Central Labor Council has done such a magnificent job of planning things, alerting everybody. And there are no picket lines because all the employers know, well, we better not open. So even the non-union employers mostly do not open for business. The streetcars have shut down, so it's hard to, it would be hard for anybody to get to work anyway. Uh, and the, central, uh, the strike committee is asking strikers not to gather, not big rallies, not any kind of commotion that would invite police violence. Uh, and instead, the Labor's War Veterans Guards, volunteers wearing white armbands go through the streets and they ask people to basically go home and certainly don't cause a ruckus uh, that might invite the police in. So this is one of the few photos we have of a street scene in the midst of it, and most like, it's near the Union Temple, and it was often interpreted as a gathering of strikers. It's more likely a gathering of people waiting on the second day of the strike for the Seattle Star to publish. Uh, the newspapers have been shut down, the newsboys are not going to deliver it, so if you want to go read one of the newspapers, you've got to go down to the plant, and that's probably what's going on here. Uh, day two, no violence, nothing going on, but the mayor has now completely wigged out, and he issues a proclamation, which you can see here, in which he says, call off the, to the General Strike Committee, call off the strike by tomorrow morning, 
or I'm going to declare martial law. Very provocative, complete nonsense. He doesn't have the authority to declare uh, martial law, but the Seattle Star loves it, and the New York Times love it, and they make him the hero of Seattle for this sort of bold, hysterical move. Meanwhile, the federal government has ordered two battalions of troops from Camp Lewis to take up stations in Seattle, and here you can see our, an army unit in front of the what was then the uh, National Guard Armory on Western Avenue. They're never called into action, but their presence obviously is, uh, is, is a concern. Uh, over the weekend, there's a lot of rethinking going on. Some of the unions uh, tell the Central Labor Council that their members are going to go back to work after the, um, after the weekend. The union record and the strike committee announce that we are keeping on and they completely ignore the mayor's threat. But in fact, the morale is crumbling. It's pretty clear that the federal government is not going to negotiate with the shipyard unions, which was the real goal. And this hysterical reaction on the part of the mayor, city authorities, and the three major newspapers um, probably wasn't really predicted by the Central Labor Council. And so now uh, there's a kind of, oh my god, what do we do now? Uh, and a sense that it's going to come to a close. And the next day, Monday, the strike committee meets and officially says, okay, we've done what we can and we will call off the strike the following day, Tuesday at noon, which is what that he the headlines read. So the strike lasts six days, the sympathy strike lasts six days. The shipyard strike will go on for two more months, not ending well for the shipyard unions, uh, but the six days of solidarity and sympathy strike are kind of what we are commemorating here. And I'm going to let Cal and Dana talk about the aftermath and what it all means and the legacy and make really something of this for all of you. Uh, it's really quite something to be back here. Uh, my dad was a union organizer, so I'm pretty used to uh, union temples. Um, hung around one a lot. Well, some of this I told you, you, you will we'll hear, but I think that I'm, I'm going to go through it because I do make a couple of arguments that are different. Um, and starting off with Anna Louise Strong, and uh, I did also want to say that uh, the labor archives are just tremendous. And I've worked in the California archives and back at Wayne State and in Washington, D.C. over my life. And, and these are just fantastic. And for Jim and Connor and Crystal and all the people who put this thing together, it's really a fantastic accomplishment. I don't know if there's any other, certainly not at the University of California. I don't know if there's uh, anything else quite like it uh, in the country. And you all need to be very uh, proud of that and thank you. And you know, these days, professors aren't so, um, don't get the respect I, that we, we, we once did. And so uh, to go uh, to the special collections and be treated with that kind of respect is really quite nice. Anna Louise Strong announced the strike in the editorial, you heard this, in the union record, labor, she said, will feed the people. Labor will take care of the babies and the sick. Labor will preserve order, and indeed that it did. For five February days, and there'd been nothing like it before, certainly not in the United States, and there's been nothing like it uh, since. It's at 10 a.m. on the 6th in the morning we've heard about Seattle's workers struck, all of them. Uh, and in doing so, they literally took control of the city. And as you heard, the strike was in support of the 35,000 uh, shipyard workers who were out, another 15,000 in Tacoma, um, who were in a conflict with the shipyard owners and the federal government's shipping board, which managed the harbors of, of the country, um, amongst other things. But, uh, I don't say this lightly, I think this is true. The strike rendered the authorities virtually powerless. There was no power for these five days which could really challenge the workers. There were soldiers in the city, uh, 
uh, and thousands more down past Tacoma at uh, Camp Lewis, and not to mention the, the vigilantes. But to unleash any of this on a peaceful city was problematic, it seems to me. And so the uh, regular police were reduced to onlookers, and I think the generals hesitated. Uh, now, today, uh, Sad to say, this strike is it's not widely remembered. It's often forgotten. It shouldn't be. It's been uh, partly f it's forgotten even in labor history because it's so often dismissed as a uh, losing cause, as something that was defeated, as something. Uh, and then there was no blood, you know, no no bloodshed. Uh, there hadn't been an inter insurrection of any sort, and I think that in the general, the, uh, you know, the, the loss of memory, and second, the confusion about what happened in the strike has led to it being uh, forgotten. And, uh, uh, but I would say it, was, it was, certainly wasn't uh, a disaster, and uh, um, it wasn't uh, a non-event. And um, I don't know that I'd so go so far as my editors to say that it was the most, uh, <laughs> the title of the book, the most spectacular labor revolt in our, well, it was pretty spectacular. So, um, we'll, take it. we'll take it. So, so you know about this. Uh, I, I sh should say as background, because I'm not actually going forward, I'm going backward, maybe. Dana will go forward. But uh, the Seattle, Seattle's port was really something. It, the, 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 Piers were municipal piers. They were owned by uh, the city, and they were modern. They were the most modern in the country, which uh, was quite important for Seattle. And of course, it was a, a, a point of pride for the city and for its, its reformers. But it also meant uh, a lot for the economy of the city. So that Seattle, uh, being two days closer to China, than San Francisco, its rival, was quite important in terms of the importance of the waterfront and the, um, and, and the uh, industry. Now, uh, one other backing up again. Uh, Seattle had always, I, I, I don't hope you don't know all of this, I, you should, but it had always been a working class destination. You know this, right? that it uh, wasn't like California. The, it wasn't a place where people came looking to strike it rich in the same way, to find uh, gold. Instead, we had uh, uh, immigrants from what was considered to be the squalid East. They were the free thinkers, the utopians, who came out to form what they called colonies around Puget Sound. That is, that they were intent on founding an industrial democracy in the here and now. Um, Eugene Debs, the socialist icon, he thought Washington State was the most advanced of all the states in the country and the most likely to reach so socialism first, and he encouraged the settlement. Um, Seattle's unions were progressive, they were allies of reform, they supported women's suffrage, they endorsed public ownership, they were divided on prohibition. Nevertheless, they moved steadily to the left in this period of time, and I want to present a a picture of a development, a process of, of, of a labor movement growing. Uh, and, and that can only be understood by understanding a bit about the past and a bit about things that were happening around the city and in, around the world. So uh, that's uh, one thing I wanted to do. So they're allies of reform, but moving to the left and they were moving to the left because they were increasingly involved in conflicts, conflicts with the various owners, employers, including progressive employers. And so uh, um, this, and, and this happened um, at a time when nationally there developed a strike wave, something like we've never seen before, the strike wave during and immediately after World War I, and it, it happened in a time of an international crisis, which culminated, you'll know, uh, in 1919 in rebellion in Germany, Hungary, Egypt, uh, 
the beginning of the Irish War of Independence, and at this time the fate of the Russian Revolution is still unknown. So all of that, I think, has to be part of this um, story. Now, in Seattle, Seattle's socialists were, I, I would say, important. They weren't all party members. But they, were in, they were all advocates of industrial unionism, was, which wasn't the case every place. Uh, and, and these people sat at the helm of the city's unions. Jimmy Duncan had been a member of the Socialist Party, still was a socialist, though not a, a member. And as you heard, Seattle was also home of the industrial worker, the IWW paper. paper. And Seattle was sort of a base camp then for radical workers throughout this entire region, for Eastern Washington, for Oregon, for Alaska, and for the mining districts of Montana, not to mention the, the sea of timber that surrounded uh, the city and the, and, the, um, and the Puget Sound area. Um, and, and all of what I'm describing here somehow led to this situation so that when the U.S. Commission on Industrial Relations met in the city in 1914, John Com Com Commons, sort of an uh, icon of industrial relations from Wisconsin, you know, you know the industrial relations people will have, have read him, know all about him. He said here, he found in Seattle, more bitter feelings between the employers and the employees than any other U.S. city. city. Um, uh, partially, uh, this had to do with the situation in the woods where the conflict between the loggers and the lumbermen was intense from uh, day one. I could tell you a, a bit about what it was like to be a, a logger, but I won't take your time, but uh, you should know that it was, it was terrible work in terrible conditions mostly young, young men, mostly itinerant workers. Uh, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn called them uh, homeless youngsters who, who could never even dream of having a home or a family or, or any of the things that are associated with uh, normal uh, life. Now, in the wintertime, when it became too wet to work in the mountains, in the hills, in the woods, these people, these loggers, would settle in Seattle and they'd sleep in skid road flop houses and they'd hang out in saloons and, and brothels, but they'd also mingle with the uh, agriculturalists who, settled, who, who wandered out here, with redundant railroad workers, with blacklisted miners, and they'd uh, mingle with the uh, Seattle's radicals and especially the ranks of the um, shipyard. Something maybe should be said about the shipyards as we get closer to time. You got a draft deferment by working in the shipyards. So you might say it attracted, a, it could attract a certain uh, kind of person. Uh, uh, so uh, the shipyards, interesting for all the ships they turned out, were not a particularly patriotic uh, bunch. Um, I'm, I, I think that the Everett situation, which you probably all know about, um, has to be seen as extremely important. I'm not going to go over it. But uh, for the people of Seattle so close to imagine that the, the IWW people had taken off from Seattle and they returned bloodied to Seattle and came into Seattle hospitals and went to jail in Seattle, for the people of, S of Seattle, this was really shattering that something should happen so close to them, unarmed, peaceful protesters shot and killed by uh, armed deputies and, and vigilantes. And it, uh, it shook the town. Um, it was seen, it seems to me, as assault on basic rights, free speech, fair play, the very notion of, of rights, uh, and, and, it's, and, and disbelief that this could happen course through Seattle's working class districts. And this in turn led to an increasing collaboration between the two movements, labor movements, the AFL movement and the IWW movement, because the Central Labor Council actually joined in the defense of the victims, which would have been anathema to the National American Federation of Labor and its uh, 
uh, leadership, but we have the sort of coming together there. Uh, IWW movement, when, these, when the, the accused were um, uh, released, found not guilty. There were celebrations around the um, Northwest. The IWW's membership soared, and that in turn laid the basis for a huge strike of some 50,000 people who worked in the woods in uh, the summer of 1917. Uh, an enormous strike, five more minutes, okay. An enormous strike also of, of great importance in terms of shaping Seattle's working class and its outlook of the consciousness of uh, these workers. Now, the, I have a, a section here on uh, James Duncan and uh, him talking about uh, 1917 being a, a year in which labor grew by almost 300 percent and he singles, singles out the women workers. And this then, it seems to me, sets the stage for what's, what's likely to happen. In 1919, the war's behind them. Uh, Seattle's workers are well organized and by all accounts that I can see, they're itching for a fight. I'm not really convinced that, you know, there was all that much soul searching. The shipyard workers were angry. They were bitter about what had happened to them. Other people felt the same. The, the issue of the high cost of living was bearing down on everyone nationally, but especially here in Seattle. So what, what I've seen is that uh, people, people want to fight. Seattle's delegates to the Mooney Convention in Chicago were the left wing of that convention. They were the ones who wanted a general strike to free Mooney now. Uh, I can't tell you what that was all about. So Anna Louise Strong, again, one of the mainstays now, uh, and really a remarkable person of the union, at the union record, uh, record, talks about a city divided into two hostile camps. So class lines are hardening. Um, uh, I, I've written here, this, the solidarity of Seattle's workers was by any standard staggering. Uh, and I'd underline that. Workers from barbers to boilermakers would cease to work. There were no pickets, also because there were no strike breakers. It's estimated there may have been 100,000 people involved in this strike because they were supported by unemployed workers, because they were supported by workers who were not members of unions, and they were supported by family members. Um, so this, uh, this is the contentious part, I, I think. Um, I, th I think we ought to uh, give some credit to the labor movement for the strides that it made in terms of recognizing the importance of women workers and uh, facilitating their movement into unions and for the fact that there was an ongoing debate in the union record on all, all of these sorts of issues about should uh, the wives of union members work, should um, uh, single women who had no husbands, should they be given preference in terms of works. There were these debates going on. It wasn't this building, but when Matt, Margaret Sanger came through town. She spoke to an overwhelming, overflowing crowd at the union, at the Labor Temple. Emma Goldman did as well, talking about um, uh, free love. Uh, um, if you look at the reading lists of the people, sometimes these people are, are, are said to be, and, and Anna Louise Strong in her Stalinist period, she sort of says this sort of stuff. Well, they didn't really know their Marxism, but they sure knew how to build. They sure knew how to build a movement. They sure knew how to organize unions. And uh, I, I would say this is at a time. Let me to put this in context. 1919, you'll remember, is the, called the Red Summer. Do you remember why that was? Chicago and the race riots in Chicago and Lake Michigan flowing with blood and, and pogroms and lynchings all over the country. So when, when the Seattle Central Labor Council says in February after the strike, all of our unions must accept black members, that seems to me to be a step forward with whatever qualification one wants to make 
you know, that's a good and, and coming at a time when the Reverend Mark Matthews, who was a big shot amongst progressives in the city, Mark Matthews was willing, and he had the biggest congregation in town, to bring a hundred clansmen in robes and have them sit in the front rows, of, in the front pews of, of his church. And so in this context, the Seattle movement was against the Alien Land Act, was against uh, the movement, the, the, the legal movement to deny Japanese the right to uh, own land. In terms, just in terms of, two points and then I'll get down. In terms of activity, this can be misleading, be, and many people say, well, this wasn't really a very interesting strike because everybody was just at home, you know, watching TV, out, <laughs> you know, out in the back garden, walking the dog, you know, whatever they were doing. But really, if you imagine, imagine all of these unions, 110 of them, meeting, meeting, meeting. The strike committee meeting in the, in the uh, labor temple, which had galleries, which would be filled with raucous, yelling, rowdy people. You know, meeting all the time. Uh, the, the feeding stations, they were called. What was going on? The, Anna Louise Strong writes some nice accounts of of the feeding stations, and they seem to have been great fun. Uh, here's one on the Monday night of the strike when it's you know, supposed to be falling apart in Georgetown. The crowd that turned out was so large, the building settled, and it had to be evacuated. The meeting reconvened, and with his quotations, and with great enthusiasm, it was decided uh, to make meetings like this one a weekly event. And it was unanimous that the strike should continue and this is the problem of ending it. It was unanimous that the strike, this, this is not a bunch of IWW guys, uh, uh, should continue until a living wage had been obtained by the shipyard workers. Many of those present expressed the opinion that the scope of the meeting should be enlarged to include the wives and daughters of the workers to make them real community uh, gatherings. And I would say in all of these places then, the strikes being discussed, analyzed, criticized, extolled, uh, debated, and uh, when the workers come together, their representatives, they, they know, they're, they're informed. They know, they know what's going on and they're making history and they uh, know it. Now, we talked about the end of the strike. Uh, I would say that most of the people, uh, few people thought that they had been defeated when they went back. Most, no, no account from the time, except for the hostile people, say that they'd been defeated. Ben Newman, a, a strike leader of, from the hoisting engineers, he said, um, uh, we did something the strike which had never been done before. I think that's true. There was a woman who wrote for the Liberator. She, she wrote under the name, a woman who was there, who said most of the men went back to work in good spirits. O'Connor said they went back with a glowing feeling. Um, um, so, so, so then what was it really about? Well, it wasn't a revolution, it was a strike, but it was a very radical strike. Uh, it wasn't a disaster, it wasn't squashed. Seattle, Seattle's workers, uh, their unions intact, would live to fight another day, and that's another subject. The IWW, who were sort of critical observers, thought that the strikers had done a good job of showing how to do a general strike. Uh, the New York Call, a socialist paper, thought that this was a good indita indication that capitalism's days were numbered. Uh, and Max Eastman, who was out here, Max Eastman, the Greenwich Village intellectual, he, he spoke, I think, for many when he judged that Seattle filled with hope and happiness the hearts of millions of people in all places of the earth. It demonstrated the possibility of that loyal solidarity of the working class, which is the sole remaining hope of liberty for mankind. Thank you for everybody. Happy anniversary. How many times do we get a 100th anniversary? And I want to... I want to thank the archives and some of that wasn't named, which is Rich Burner. And Rich Burner, when I came to use these archives in 1984, he had built up the archives in the 70s. Before people started dying out, he went around and knocked on the doors of all the, all the unions and asked for their records. And that was the collection 
and got the Harry Alt papers, which is the, and Harry Alt was the editor of the Union Record. And those two, that, that, those two categories is what's made possible my book and also make sure that the Union Record was preserved and microfilmed and before we had online digital <laughs> digitization. So yeah, I want to honor Rich Berner. I, I'm really happy to be back here in Seattle. I'm seeing people I haven't seen in 25 years, including Bob Barnes, who I knew from the Labor Committee on Central America in 1985. I want to thank Connor Casey and the Organizing Committee and Jim Gregory for his endless work of solidarity and labor history and for carrying the torch, as he says at the very end of the very end of his reprint of Bob Friedheim's book that he, um, I, I, I gave him all my notes from my first book and just said, okay, it's up to you now, I'm out of here, I'm, <laughs> I'm done. And both Jim and Cal, of course, now I have to follow them. They've said much as what I wanted to say and said it so beautifully. So I'm stuck being the woman cleaning up. Or as Jim put it, I'm, and maybe it's that I get to bat clean up. Okay, now, now I'm from San Francisco. I will refrain to making a joke about the Giants versus the Mariners. <laughs> okay, I just want to wrap it up and bring it to the present. Um, and I want to, I'm going to talk around a general theme, which is the tension between the romantic and the practical both in 1919 and at the time of the strike, and in the way we remember it and drawn it for struggles uh, today. The tension or contradictions or dynamic between the great romantic moments that we celebrate and need inside our souls and the practical hard realities of a labor movement both then and now. So, you know, you know a lot by now, um, both before you walked in here and after these presentations, that this general strike was the product of many things coming together, and the biggest one was AFL unions being influenced by the influx of those IWW people during the war and coming in from the region. The AFL unions, it's really important to talk about who they were because they were about institutionalized long-term power. The unions that, that, that built this were stable white workers trying to build meaningful lives in the middle of the chaos and terrors of a capitalist economy. They were the great base of, their institutions were the base of the Seattle general strike. Men and women, overwhelmingly white men. The IWW was much smaller, but it had these numbers of people that came into the shipyards and the docks in particular during the war into some of the other unions. They too were overwhelmingly white men. And they were itinerant workers, as Cal has said, in the most dangerous sectors of the economy, particularly in lumber. They had indeed nothing to lose but their chains. Um, for them, the rhetoric, the revolutionary rhetoric, nothing to lose but your chains, because they had little to lose. They could call general strike a revolution and have little to lose. But they actually, as many have said, have, have identified, had almost no concrete vision of what came afterward and how you would deal with capital's counter-revolutions and how you organize society, that famous Father Haggerty's Wheel of Fortune, you might have seen, it was like, this is how the society is going to be, and this is this was going to be organized after the, revol the great general strike that would bring the revolution. That was it. it they didn't believe in dues paying organizations, they didn't believe in stable institutions, and so they are bringing this exciting fervor about, but they have nothing to lose in that, as opposed to the FFL members who are striking precisely because they have a lot to lose. They want to defend the gains they've made during the war. The inflation, the post-war post -war inflation is eating up their gains, their wage gains. They know that the federal money is stopping. The, the real thing that ends the labor movement in its, in its dramatic form was not the general strike so much as that the, the money flowing in from the federal government for the shipyards stopped. So those 30,000 shipyard workers lose their jobs and all the money that flowed into the economy and also the labor shortages that created. They knew there was going to be a backlash. They were not, for the most part, playing revolution. They were trying to sustain institutionalized gains that affected their daily lives. The Seattle general strike is the, is the product of both of those with key socialist figures in the middle of that, like James Duncan or Anna Louise Strong. If you look at the Seattle general strike, it's about the support for the shipyard workers' demands, but it was also designed to send a message, a powerful message, to capital about the power of labor. It's like, look what we can do, and look what we just did. And, but as Cal and Jim underscored, it was thick, and it's really great if you read, I haven't read Cal's book yet, but the um, Robert Friedheim book, which I would underscore, it was co-written with his wife, Robin Friedheim, and thanks to Jim for bringing her back into history. It was thick with practical realities, 
And those of us that are involved in the labor movement today, which is hopefully everybody in the room, we know how thick those realities can be. I'm always groaning that the labor movement is always more problematic than you ever thought it could be. And the deeper you go in, the more you groan. And, you know, so let's not, you know, like there's the romantic, but it's like, oh my goodness. Um, at the, you know, and the, the most obvious one, and Friedham is very good at the debates around this, is that the general strike was a solidarity strike, a sympathy strike, in solidarity with the shipyard workers. That's what solidarity is all about, right? But whose demands were getting met here and who weren't, right? All those non-shipyard workers, what were they, in fact, getting out of this and what did they think they were? And how did they understand how that solidarity would or wouldn't overflow to their demands when they were, would they be next? Or was it about establishing the power of a labor movement in general? And they have a stake in those broader class dynamics, but very interesting, why should those individual unions all strike? And that's the practical realities. Um, and, um, I think we also have to, everybody's been saying thank you, it used to just be me out there in the wilderness saying this, uh, we have to talk about the race and gender politics of the saddle labor movement at the time. And I remember I gave a talk about race relations in the labor movement in this room in the mid-90s and I got pushed back from white people in the audience. Like why are we talking about this, this is not what we want to talk about. I did not get pushed back from the people of color in the audience. Um, all the AFL unions, with the exception of the Longshoremen's Union, were hideously racist, didn't allow any people of color. And it's not just that they sort of, gee, happened and didn't let people of color in. They used their union power to keep people of color out of the workplace. So you can't get, they have closed shop, great, they have the closed shop. They're using the closed shop to keep men and women of color out of any jobs. And I want to underscore that it's not a passive thing. That's what those closed shop agreements were about in construction, in, in, the, in the shipyards, in restaurants, all over the place. Now, if you're wondering about the scale of things, the Seattle population is about 315,000 at the time. There are 6,000 Japanese workers, all immigrants, 2,500 African American people, and about 1,000 Chinese. So most of the Chinese had been driven out in the late 19th century to San Francisco by white workers. Now, this strike was not their strike. I think that you might have heard Jim notice, point out that there was a parallel union of Japanese unions. And, you know, you can read their news, there's a newspaper from the Japanese community, and they had all these unions, like there was, if, when we talk about the barbers union, there's a reference earlier to the barbers and the ladies barbers. There were actually three barbers unions in Seattle. There was the barbers union, which was the white male barbers union. Now, here we have race and gender as like, unmarked categories. No one, they didn't call themselves the white male barbers union, they got to be the barbers. Then there was the lady barbers union, and that was the white women barbers, right? And then there was the Japanese barbers union, and that was the Japanese men, and they let in a few women as far as I can tell. There were women lady barbers, and it's a long tradition um, in, in Washington state, in, in Hawaii, of lady barbers. A lot of these Japanese, there are also Japanese unions in butchers, in um, several other things, nursery workers, and a lot of those Japanese labor activists were socialist exiles from Japan. A lot of them were followers of a guy named San Katayama. They had sophisticated socialist ideas, but they were cut off by white workers from the white left. So when we talk about the Seattle left in this period, there's a very explicit and sophisticated internationalist Japanese left in Seattle that's cut out of this labor movement for the most part. The IWW, now this is interesting, they actually had some explicit anti-racist rhetoric, but statistically did not have more um, people of color in their membership than did the AFL or the, these independent uh, unions. Um, and I, I just want to say, I'm trying to get this a little more specific. I, you know, I read a really great book about the history of Seattle. Read the autobiography of Horace Caton. And his father was the African-American man whose father was the editor of, of Caton's Weekly, and you can see a copy of it out here, which was a Republican Party newspaper that his father put out. And Horace Caton uh, was, worked in a shipyard during the um, Seattle, during the period of the Seattle General Strike, excuse me, as a longshoreman. Um, and very, if you want, a really interesting story about racism in Seattle in, in this period. So I guess I want to underscore, it's not like, oh, here we have the strike, and then we have, by the way, they were racist. It was a power movement of white supremacist unions continuing their power, and they used their power to exclude people of color. Now, and we have to be, we have to be able to hang on to that. Um, then what about the white women? Um, there were, we've heard about these newish, 
unions of white women, they were about a th maybe a thousand white women union members. They were all in manufacturing or else the waitresses. And, but, they were, but the whole world of service and clerical work and domestic service, which is where most women work, was completely untouched by the labor movement. So the more their employment looked like that of the white men, then they would be um, welcome in the unions. They were also active, as Foka said, as wives in the labor movement, so that those that were in heterosexual family relationships, if their men folk got better wages, could benefit from that. Right? So if you're working in the home and your man brings home money, you're going to be able to have more money spent on food or you know, it's going to help your labor in the home. But we do have to ask, who was, how would the general strike help them or not in their labors in the home? Um, what, so finally, when we look at the general strike at that time, um, I would just underscore it's about two different things. And first and foremost, as you can hear, it's a spectacular display of union power. But also, as the folks have said, it, it demonstrates that working people were capable of running the city themselves peacefully. And as Jim has sort of pointed to, there was an impressive range, not just of co-ops, but labor-owned and controlled institutions in the time. Maybe 20 consumer cooperatives, maybe a dozen producer cooperators. And these included tailors, garage mechanics, um, uh, painters, butchers, shoe repairers, carpenters, a labor-owned slaughterhouse, a labor-owned movie theater, all kinds of institutions, a dairy distribution service, things that we don't even know how to imagine today. And the jewel in the crown, of course, was the Seattle Union record. And my number is a circulation of 120,000. That might have been the 19... Wait, there's a master's thesis in the Seattle, in the University of Washington Library about the Seattle Union record. We can argue statistics. But go look at the Seattle Union record. Don't just look at the headlines here. I think, is it available digitized? And read it. It's unbelievable. They have like the working class advice column. They have the ads are riveting. The stories of daily life. The one ads, the classified ads are riveting. And you get a feel for the full wor world of labor's institutions on many fronts, not just the unions. And it'll send shivers up your spine. And a lot of that 120,000 readers were outside of Seattle who read it because they had such great analysis of world news, not just what was happening in Seattle. Um, and you know, as, although we know that the strike was more or less lost, it's really tricky as a historian to say what, how things um, end. Because you know, we all know, labor people know that you don't get that headline the next morning that said, strike actually gained, gained these 50 things, right? Forever and ever. You get like, well, they sort of conceded, the bosses conceded this one little small thing. You won't get the headline that organizing works for a really long time, okay? Because what the strike did is that both working people and the rich learned two things and remembered them well. Because if working people could first do it, they could do it again, okay? And that shadow hangs over class relations, not just in Seattle, but all over the country, just as the Revol Russian Revolution is going to have a shadow. And that shadow is going to, I'm trying to work on my metaphor here, that shadow is going to rise up <laughs> in the 1930s, 10 years later, and, or 15 years really, really motivated. And actually, Seattle has a very thriving co-op movement in the early 30s. Capital knew that, but also working people had it inside themselves that we did this thing, and you can't take that memory away from people. And they carry that for decades, and we are part of that collective memory that this thing happened, right? Which is independent of whether they won or not. The reality is they ran the city for depending four or five days and showed it could be done peacefully, and we have that memory of what can be done that isn't just about general strikes. Obviously, we care because it echoes into we could do it for good, right? So today, the Seattle general strike um, is a shining light over a hundred years. What a beautiful thing we're celebrating. What do we actually celebrate today? It's the same tension between the romantic and the practical. The romantic thing that we feel in our bones, they actually did it. Some of these same unions are still here, the same numbers. But we also have to be careful not to over-romanticize it, particularly the IWW. I just meet people all the time, young people, students, they love the IWW, but they would never come to a real union meeting. They love to talk about revolution, but they don't want to do the icky, <laughs> diff, diff, 
I'm speaking Spanish here, D difficile, Dif difficult work of going to a meeting three nights a week. And you know, you guys know this, that movie, This Is What Democracy Looks Like, about the WTO protests. Like, have you ever looked around in a meeting and thought, oh my God, this is what democracy looks like? You know, <laughs> whoa, okay, here we go. And that, that is part of what we have to take it and sustain it in the slogging work of building unions today. And finally, if we're gonna celebrate it, we have to face up to the racism and sexism in the history of the US and the Seattle movement, not just in Seattle, and see that not just as a side story. And I also wanna underscore something else in Seattle history that hasn't been talked about, that I didn't talk about in my book, and I'm ashamed of this now, I got it, I didn't look at it, which is in 1919 and 1920, there are de deportations of thousands of Seattle working people and left people by the federal government and vid vigilantes, mostly from Eastern Pure Europe and Russia that were deported as part of a national thing, but that a huge deportation wave that I don't think people know about today that happened, you can read about it in the Seattle, union record, if you, anybody, please do some research about that. And there was also a movement and demonstrations against the deportations. So somebody needs to go back and claim that movement as part of Seattle history as we talk about deportations and US imperialism and the class politics of that today, which obviously I'm with my other book I'm involved in. So let me just throw that out there. You can see it all in, in the union record. Um, and also finally, as we incorporate all these stories into our narratives, we can learn from the creative synergy of the Seattle General Strike and conceptualize our labor movement today in much broader terms than the labor movement did even at the time. We can see our movement not just as narrowly defined groups of workers fighting for more gains for themselves through narrowly defined contracts, but instead envision a labor movement embedded with and in support of all kinds of other movements for social justice, including the immigrants' rights movement, which has produced the biggest working class demonstrations in US history in May, on May Day in 2003 and 4, the Black Lives Matter movement, the LGBTI movement, the women's movement, and so many other struggles that people here are part of. That means that we need our own beautiful, romantic, overarching, overarching vision of the how the world can be different and lots of irritating meetings, compromises, and institution building. <laughs> The Saddle General Strike was all about solidarity on a, solid, on a practical, palpable, spectacular level. Let, let me end by celebrating that that was solidarity made real. Let's remind the rich what we can do. We could do it again. Let's dream of taking power and claim it as part of our history in our bones. In our hands is placed a power greater than their hoarded gold, greater than the might of atoms magnified a thousandfold, we can bring to birth a new world in the ashes of the old, for the union makes us strong. Solidary forever. So uh, this question is for Dana Franks. You talked in your book about uh, the, the, the parallel Japanese unions and the, the Japanese socialist movement. Could you explore that even more, how the Japanese came to their understanding of socialism, socialism from where it came? Um, a lot of what I know comes from a book by a guy named Kazuo Ito. And he did interviews with people, Japanese community, community in the 70s. He was a man from Japan, and he did a, like a 300-page book of interviews. And you can get it in the... UW Library, it's called Issei, I-S-S-E-I, and the, he interviewed all kinds of people, and there are a bunch of different, I mean, some of them are, um, and there's a guy named Kazuo, uh, excuse me, Sen Katayama, and some of these people were um, Congress members and held political office in Japan. I don't know that much about what kinds of socialists they were. Um, Sen Katayama ended up being on the Comintern in the, later in the 20s, and um, he came to the United States as well. There's a whole biography of him about his experience working as a cook for white leftists in, in, in the early 20s in, in Seattle. I would encourage you to get that book, uh, Issei, by, um, by Kazuo Ito, and you can read that. Um, and um, also, you know, talk to people um, at the Wing Luke Museum. I think they have done research about the Japanese community. I don't want to speak on, on behalf of that. And I can't read Japanese. I did pay someone to translate. There's some documents in the archives at UW of the, the they're basically the um, bylaws of some of those Japanese unions, which is how, how I learned about them. <laughs> 
Yeah, this question's for Dana Frank. I think it's a really great insight about how um, the lesson of the strike uh, was for both the rich and for the working class. This is what the working class can do and how that, that carried over in the 1930s. When you think of it, it's, that's like 12 years later, which is like yesterday's memory. And I'm just wondering um, if you've found references in the in literature about the, about the, uh, the union organizing movements of, uh, during the Depression, if there was anything that explicitly sort of made reference to that. Oh, you know, that's a really great question and I have no idea. I think Jim might be able to answer that. I can tell you one thing is that memory doesn't just happen in one place. I know that, you know, Clark Kerr, some people like Clark Kerr was the president of the University of California, very famously during the free speech movement, and he wrote his PhD dissertation about the co-op movement in the early 30s, so there's where you get that memory, and you can read his dissertation. I don't know that much about it. I'm just ashamed I moved on to other topics. Um, but, um, wait, I had something to say. That one thing that's very interesting, if you read Harry Alt, the papers, of Harry Alt, who was the editor of the Union Record. And I read everything up through the end of the 20s. There's all these letters, and I talk about this very briefly in the book, I don't remember where. There's all these people that wrote in and said, hi, we're all down here in LA, and so-and-so is here. And there was a huge diaspora of Seattle leftists that, uh, to, of all stripes, including people, many people who had been presidents and officers of key unions. Uh, that moved all to, Los to Long Beach. Somebody says, well, so-and-so's here in Long Beach, and so-and-so's in San Francisco, and so-and-so's in Oakland, and so-and-so's in Chicago. So that collective memory doesn't just happen in Seattle. Those people carried their, when they got thwarted in the 20s, when things really cracked down, and also what the headline of what happens in the 20s is the left, the right side of the labor movement kicks out the left side of the labor movement, right? So, and really cracks down on the left side. So by the end of the 20s, it's an exercise that somebody put in self-satisfied defeatism. You know, and their, 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 their biggest agenda is labor management cooperation by 1927 or 28 because they've written the, the combination of the federal government and the right wing of the labor movement and the internationals, the, the Union Internationalists have come down on the left unions in, in Seattle and the Wabis have left town or been repressed. So some of that collective memory of what happened, and you can see that in those Harry Alt letters, is happening in other places and historians that's pretty much impossible to track you know, how those things move around from one place to the other. So, you know, and collective memory is a slippery thing that moves around in many, many different ways and pops up and it's very, very hard to track how that happens. But it's a great question, I don't know, you know. And now we would just Google general strike every five years and see what popped up. I, I, I don't think that's so difficult. The whole cadre of the communist movement came through Seattle, you know, was either here or, or came through at this period of time with people who, care, who personally carried um, these experiences, rightly or wrongly, into the 1930s. I think there, you know, there was much more of a literature of the labor movement at that time, which made things like the Seattle general strike, uh, you know, better known than it might be um, now. We... Uh, <laughs> Fifty years ago, at the University of Washington, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the uh, Seattle general strike, and we had uh, Harvey O'Connor come and speak, and he wrote, of course, uh, Revolution in Seattle, which seems to me to be still, over in a way, the best book uh, that you could possibly read uh, about this subject, but so he, he became an internationally known journalist. I think you can follow the careers of any number of leaders of the movement in the 1930s uh, and, and find out how the connections were made. I found out about the general strike because my father was a union organizer who took me to see Hangman's Bridge in Centralia when I was 10 years old, which I don't know if that was such a great idea. Um, <laughs> the uh, the, anyway, I think I, I wouldn't say that that's so difficult. The, um, although I think the issue of memory is extremely important. We should note here, though, uh, the book of Katsutoshi Kurakawa on Jam Japanese immigrants and the American labor movement, who I think gives quite a different take on the relationship between Japanese workers and uh, Anglo workers than, than uh, Dana does. Um, one thing to come back into this because of what I said earlier on. I think we're leaving out when we talk about white workers and white unions, we're leaving out the fact that these, even at their worst, this was contested 
terrain. There was a fight going on in all of these places. The, the Socialist Party in Washington State was all part of the left-wing faction of the uh, Socialist Party. They weren't the same as Victor Berger and the right-wing faction of the Socialist Party. Uh, uh, Kurokawa makes a, a great point of saying that the Japanese immigrants were well aware of the IWW and what their position was on, the que on questions of um, racial relations. Kate Sadler, who I don't, I don't know if I mentioned her at all, Kate Sadler was truly one of the great figures of, of this whole period in Seattle. She was known as the Workers' jo uh, Joan of Arc. She was the most popular speaker of any worker uh, in the state. Kate Sadler, her husband was the um, president of the Longshoremen's Union for a while. She was a, 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 a she was a intense opponent of exclusion in all of these forms. Now, what was the balance of power? Well, it shifted. It went back and forth and so forth. But to leave, I, we should never leave out the fact. Certainly, it must be important for us that there's a there's an ongoing fight at all of these times. And I I believe that you could make the point that the struggle that took place in the Pacific Northwest and the lessons that came out of all of those struggles moved the working class movement. It was a, the, the, the thing about the, the general strike, it was a class movement, I would argue. It wasn't a movement of 110 individual unions. It was a class movement. That's what held it together. But within all of that, there's a uh, tension, there's a conflict, uh, the, uh, it's a contested terrain, and up until and through 1919, it seems to me, some remarkable gains were made. Let me just add another dimension to this question of sort of how the story and the collective memory uh, moved and influenced people. It influenced the course of reactionary politics as well. Our dear mayor, Ole Hansen, celebrated on the New York Times as the savior of Seattle, then pretty quickly quits. Sort of like Sarah Palin, I don't know. Uh, he quits, goes on the road, writing a book called Americanism Against Bolshevism, goes on the road crisscrossing the country for the next year or so, giving paid speeches, making a fortune, uh, and rotary clubs and chambers of commerce in which he's teaching these business class leaders how to fight Bolshevism. It feeds, it's a part of the Red Scare uh, and he's one of the people who receives a letter bomb, so he gets to say, oh, these anarchists are killing all of us. But the Red Scare is, be is learning. It's being propelled in part by the lessons that the right is developing out of this movement. Anybody ever n been to Southern California and San Clemente? Is that a... Michael has. So uh, it, San Clemente is the home of the Richard Nixon Presidential Library. Uh, if you drive through San Clemente, you're also going to see the name Ole Hansen everywhere. He took the million dollars or so that he earned from these speaking tours, and he went back to his old trade, which was real estate development, and he found this lovely beach area above, north of San Diego, and he plotted it out and developed it as the He's the founding father of San Clemente. So that's another legacy of the general strike. That's where all the money went. Um, what do you think, Andrew? Should, so. I have a quick question. One more hand up. One more. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. OK, go. Actually, I am a journalist, and I work with Democracy. Uh, I'm actually a journalist, and I work with Democracy Watch News. And when we have our national press briefing every week, we always get questions about Seattle and the WTO demonstrations. And so, Dana, I heard you mention how the 1919 general strike kind of influenced other movements. Can you? I know it's a kind of general question. Can you talk a little bit about how that uh, laid down a precedent? for what happened during the WTO demonstrations when so many thousands of union workers were out on the streets, and then also how that uh, parlayed later into the Occupy movement. I am on the WTO protest, so I was thinking about that because I was supposed to do a book signing last night at Elliott Bay. They got canceled, and the last time I was at Elliott Bay was the night Wednesday night of the WTO protests, and I gave a book signing on my Buy American book at the 
two blocks out of the curfew zone, or the, like the tanks are right there. So you talk about the tanks in the street, those of us saw the tanks in the street, know that how class power can work in the seemingly lovely middle-class white city. Um, and, but I, you know, I, I, not, I don't know of any resonance from the general strike to the WTO protest, but the WTO protest, again, you talk about shadows, right? And that it scares people. I, you know, I saw these like, these super elite delegates in the most expensive suits and shoes you ever saw ran, walking around in front of the Olympic Hotel, you know, the day of the, you know, like those people are scared. They know that they are at risk the way the rest of us always feel at risk. And um, I think I, that's probably bigger than I can do. I want to say something about the memory of General Sy because I was thinking about what Cal said about how communists, socialists, anarchists carry these memories in formal left organizations, and certainly the Oakland general strike of 1934 in solidarity with dock workers is a really important moment, the next big general strike in US history to mark. But also that I have, I have to admit that I'm, this is not the tone we want to end on, but I've never seen a reference to Seattle general strike in subsequent labor history outside of Seattle. You know, mites have one sentence. And so how much it do, these things are local histories, Right, you know that in Oakland has in the Bay Area. There's a tremendous sense of memory of the 1934 general strike in Oakland, and and so, so we have different ways of remembering things now. Um, but that Seattle has such a beautiful sense of its own history. That's like you know, God, people were. I have to say, institutionalizing the history of the WTO process like five minutes after it ended, and I want to celebrate that just as celebrating this hundredth anniversary event. Indeed, great. And, and we're going to have we're going to have one more question. Um, no, 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 behind you. Behind you. Behind you. You know what? We got progressive stack going on. Let's have a woman voice here, okay? We got a bunch of men speaking, and these. Okay. Yeah, you, she's actually had her hands up, up no, for a minute. No, the woman in pink has had her hand up. Oh well. As somebody who did participate in the WTO demonstrations. I can tell you that those were also totally and completely peaceful. The mayhem was caused by outside agitators, young archivists, uh, or uh, <laughs> wrong, wrong, wrong word, uh, wrong, wrong word. Sorry, I fish, I word wrong word. But it it uh, was caused by. Anarchists. That was. Uh, I understand that they came up from parts of Oregon, not to put down Oregon, but they, uh, basically they were caused by outside forces that were there. I think to make us look bad. But I can guarantee you that if anybody in the march uh, started to do something damaging, somebody within the crowd would say, "Go." bring that person in, we do not cause vandalism. And I'd say all the damage to the windows and everything was done by people other than the WTO marchers. That was a very good a demonstration, if you ask me. Thank you. Uh, Bob, Bob, Bob right behind. Okay. All right, we're going we're gonna to bump over Leith, and I'm sure he'll understand because he supports women's rights. Hi, thanks for letting me ask my question. Thank you so much for this panel. I flew from Honolulu to hear you guys. <laughs> so my question is about a group of people that have always fascinated me in the Seattle General Strike, and to any of the three of you who could help me with this, and that's the ones who were called the two-card men. The what? The two-card men. The people who held cards both in the IWW and one of the AFL unions, and how there was a more common thing in Seattle than it was in the rest of the country, and it was more common at that time than later when it got harder. And I, I find them such a great emblem of what you said, Dana, about the combination of practicality and vision, and how it comes together in the body of the same person that you both try to make the world you've got a little better and you try to make a better world. Go ahead, Cal. Well, the, the expression was, I've got two cards, one's for my job and one's for my principles. So that, so that was an expression. What I think is interesting about it and uh, that it was much more common here than in other places as far as I know, 
is the, what, what I tried to mention, and that was the fact that there's a certain coming together of the different forces in the movement uh, around the issue of industrial unionism oftentimes, but a coming together of IWW people becoming more like regular trade unionists, that is with their AFL card, and uh, AFL people becoming more like uh, IWW people. So that Jimmy Duncan, uh, the leader of the uh, Central Labor Council, uh, who's a big fan of the Russian Revolution, who, you know, for, and, and stays one, um, uh, and is, uh, he's a moderate, you know, or he's a, anyway, so that uh, he tells Gompers to his face, you know, that uh, these people have some pretty good ideas, and if we don't try to catch up and learn from them, they're going to overtake us uh, and, and, and win. So you have in Seattle lots of people who are IWW members who, what, they want, I mean, I suppose some of them, they want to settle down and get a job. Maybe they don't want to go back to the, to the wheat fields of eastern Washington or back to the, the woods. Uh, so they get a job and they act as kind of, a, and this is why, there's one reason why the AFL hated them, but they are to a certain degree a kind of group within uh, the union, and they're accused of dual unionism. But it, it worked out apparently in a pretty easygoing way in, in Seattle, so that amongst the shipyard workers there were lots and lots of people who were called two card uh, men. It was against it was against the rules, by the way, of both organizations. It was against the rules of the AFL to be a member uh, of the uh, IWW, and it was against the rules of the IWW to be a member of the AFL. Seattle way, break the rules. 